Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. With me is Mr. Shane Mahoney, who needs really no introduction. Uh, but those of you who follow Shane know of his work at Conservation Visions, a component of which is the Wild Harvest Initiative and everything related to wild harvest. So, Shane, thanks for being here and taking the time to talk about wild food and wild harvest. Well, it's always a pleasure, Randy. I always enjoy it. We always have fantastic conversations. I'm sure this will be one as well. I, I'm sure it will. Yeah, absolutely. So, Shane, you've spent so much of your recent career, a career that spans many topics, many subjects related to conservation and hunting and all the things that, that revolve around wild food and wild harvest. Mm -hmm. What is the Wild Harvest Initiative? Well, I think most people today are familiar with um, the idea of natural foods and local foods and these kinds of um, sort of new trends in society where people are evaluating food in a much different way uh, than we have in the past. Although, in a sense, it's a bit of a return to our past when we start to think about these yeah. foods in those circumstances. And so we have, you know, lots of game dinners and things of this nature when we're talking about foods that are harvested by hunters, for example, um, both not only in Canada and the United States, but indeed in other parts of the world, such as Europe and so on, where we're talking about recreational hunting. But um, one of the things that um, I learned after spending a long time in government, of course, as a, as a research scientist there, and later as a fairly high-level person administering programs and dealing with political elites, is that you can have a lot of nice to do things, you know, things that make people feel good and which we enjoy and which are helpful in that way. But if you really want to change the course of direction for something you believe in, you absolutely have to be able to influence policymakers. And the policymakers are at some level quite different than simply engaging with your friends. Yeah. They require information and knowledge and we might even say data, you know, yep. on which to make a decision or to um, pass a law, uh, develop a policy or a regulation or whatever that might be. And hunting, as we know, is a minority activity. Uh, in today's world. Yep. There's no question about that. It's a very small minority activity. Um, and therefore, one worries about its future. Um, and um, so the Wild Harvest Initiative is an attempt to intersect those realities. We have a, something I care deeply about, which I think is very important to humanity, um, and something that I know ultimately will be decided by two intersecting uh, sort of political forces. One are the political elites, in other words, the people we elect the government, mm -hmm. and the other is going to be by the general public. And what is missing from the equation thus far, when we talk about the issue of food specifically uh, with regard to hunting, is there has never been this kind of detailed listing of all of the species that we hunt, the numbers of animals we take each year, and turning that into an actual expression of the amount of food. Mm -hmm. And because the amount of food is in fact quite substantial, and because it is also fitting in with these trends in society of people being concerned about where their food comes from, uh, you know, how healthy the food is that yeah. they're actually consuming, um, I wanted to develop a program where we would actually assess how much wild food is being provided by recreational hunters initially, uh, by recreational fishers as well, and then hopefully to expand that to include the more harvesting and gathering and circumstances such as wild berry picking, you know, wild fruit gathering, wild rice, medicinal plants, uh, wild fungi, shed antlers, uh, Christmas trees, wildflowers. Uh, I mean, there is, when you think about it, there's, there's still this, you know, deeply relevant and highly practiced engagement with nature uh, that deals with harvesting. Yeah. And some people do a lot of different things. They hunt, they fish, they, they gather wild mushrooms. Some, right. Yeah. Some people um, are not particularly inclined to, say, hunt, but they may do other things. They may fish, and they may also gather other wild foods. And I think it's a reminder to us um, 
of several things that I think are of vital importance. Um, we remain, no matter how sophisticated or distant our cities, for example, globally may appear, we all remain directly dependent on the natural world for our sustenance. Yes, I am. Yeah. And, and that's true even of, of people who don't necessarily harvest their own, in a sense. I mean, take wild fish, for example. Um, and so I think that's a very important uh, message to, to have the world uh, reminded of, not only because we are facing great challenges in terms of feeding the billions of people that live on this planet, um, but also because the people who engage in the harvesting of wild animals directly, and this can include even commercial fisheries, they tend to develop a great interest in keeping that resource around. Yeah. And keeping healthy resources such as fish and wildlife around, ultimately, Randy, depends on having healthy systems in which they live, oceans, streams, you know, landscapes. And to me, therefore, this issue of wild food suddenly becomes central to the thinking about all of this. Um, you know, how do we maintain healthy ecosystems? How do we provide access to them that is not harmful to the environment, or at least does so in a way where our harvest can be sustainable and the species can be sustainable? And to do it in a way that suddenly takes, uh, you know, it's sort of, sort of unclothes the, the kind of complicated intellectualism and scientific jargon and all of that and speaks to people directly about something that every single human being at every race, class, religion, skin color, um, political system in the world cares directly and fundamentally about, yeah. which is food. Yeah, and the sustainability of that, for someone like me, who the majority of my food has a wild component to it. Yeah. And without the sustainability part of that that you yeah. always talk about, I try to think about where we're going with this. Where, where can a population almost at 8 billion people mm -hmm. take these demands and do it in a sustainable manner to the wild systems that provide for so many of us? Yeah. Well, it's a major challenge for the world. I mean, if you if you attend any sort of international discussion today, whether it's you know the, the G20 or, or some great summit of the World Economic Forum or whatever it might be, um, everyone is suddenly coming to realize that our future is really uh, you know, dependent now more than ever on us making certain decisions about how we're going to treat this planet. Yeah. And it's fine for some people, you know, to sort of dismiss that and say, well, you know, I've heard all that environmental uh, gobbledygook before. Uh, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that, you know, we do need food. We do need fresh water. We don't want to be burnt to death by scorching fires all the time. We don't want to have droughts that are recurring at such a state that, you know, reservoirs like Lake Mead are at levels that are almost unbelievable in this country. We don't want to be conceiving schemes to bring water from the Great Lakes to the Central Valley of California, which, believe it or not, is something that's actually being considered uh, so that you can produce enough food in this, you know, the richest country in the world um, for, for your own people. So, I mean, I think we're coming to a stage where there's a realization that uh, this is not just uh, academic uh, discussion or, you know, somebody who sits in a small office in a... In a in a mystique uh, university and, you know, ponder such questions. <laughs> I mean, in reality, this is the, this is the yeah. face of it. And uh, you look at the, the, the conditions in Canada and the United States, I mean, two very wealthy democratic countries. Um, the number of people in our own two countries who are food challenged is a, is a disgrace, yeah. frankly. Uh, but it's a reality that, you know, brings home this question if you expand that to the global environment and all the people on all the continents where human beings exist, uh, then you can imagine the scale of this problem. Yeah. And, you know, the whole COVID thing that took place, you, you, you saw the reverberations that took place there and the, how these things get complicated as we try to figure out how to provide food and materials and things we need to ourselves now that we have all become so 
dependent on these long distance transportation systems to bring us whether it's our shirts or our <laughs> or tomatoes or toilet paper or, or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think this idea of this idea of trying to look more locally at what our environments can do is a critical thing. And I firmly believe that um, there are really two ideas out there that make to me the most sense for developing a sort of a wholesome approach to all of this where every citizen can see themselves in it and where we have a chance of finally developing strategies that will really work for sustainability. And that is number one, to look at this emerging issue of One Health, mm -hmm. this idea that you know we are all in this together, every living thing and all the systems yeah. of, the, of the planet are together. It's an old idea, but it's, it's coming into fruition now. I think that's critically important. And I think the other thing that is not so much out there yet, but which I would like to see introduced to this and which I'm hoping will come out of the Wild Harvest Initiative, is the idea of looking at every single landscape as a food provisioning system first and foremost. Yeah. You know, when we, we develop things in this country, in the United States, or we develop them in Canada, and this is pretty much true in the Western world, certainly, you know, somebody wants to build a mine or build a ski lodge or build whatever it might be. Or whatever. Yeah. We, have a, we have an environmental process that kicks in, and they differ somewhat between the countries, and there are some state-level and provincial-level differences as well. But overall, the approach is the same, and I spent a great deal of time as a caribou biologist, you know, weighing out the impacts of various developments on, on that particular species and responding to questions about that. And, you know, that's, um, that's something that we, we, tend to, we tend to look at, the numbers of animals involved, we tend to look at well, how much of their habitat might be taken or whether there's going to be pollutants resulting from a mine or something of this nature, but never ever, ever have we looked at those landscapes and under the environmental assessment processes of our countries and said, well, how much wild food production is going to be lost as a result of these developments? <laughs> if you look at the amount of land that's buried under asphalt in our two countries oh, yeah. and think about what could be produced there, yeah. uh, and my, my bias, of course, is to try to produce as much wild natural food as possible. Mm -hmm. I recognize that we have to have industrial agriculture. We, we cannot escape it. There's, as you mentioned in a conversation before we began discussing this morning, you saw that we've passed 8 billion people on the planet. Yeah. Um, we have to have industrial uh, agriculture, and we can do that well when we wish to, and we can do it even better than we are doing it, and I'm sure and hopeful that we will. But I really do believe that we could be producing far much more, much more wild food if we apply the scientific understandings we have of natural systems now and actually set as a goal that we're going to look at this, you know, these alpine meadows and we're going to look at these mountains and we look at these lowlands and these wetlands along the rivers and the rivers themselves and so on. And we're going to really think about, well, if we really manage those primarily for the production of abundant wildlife and wild foods, what would that really look like? It would look a lot different. It would. The, the policies would be a lot different. They the would. The approaches would be a lot different. They the would. considerations, the stakeholders, it, it would be a monumental shift through the, to the lens through which we view these things. It would be. And well, I, you know, whether you're a hunter like me who is takes the responsibility for gathering a lot of their own food or I fish, I mean, yep. I, I do all these things that would yep. be considered a wild harvester. Uh, even someone who, like me, who does that, it would be a huge shift in how I look at these landscapes. It, it, that's totally I, true. I, I'd like to think I'd look at them in yeah. you know, the, a manner like that, but to hear you say it, no, I, I've never looked at the next subdivision or the next project. No one How much, well, food is being taken out of the system yeah. because of that human activity. Yeah. Well, it's a, it, it would be a transformative thing, and it would also, of course, um, it would also mean that um, we would have to think about, you know, how, how do we make access to that food most efficient and most effective? It would change, it would change a great many things. There'd be this domino effect once we started to look at that, as you point out, <laughs> and, and legislators would have to look at things uh, 
very differently. It's like under certain environmental assessment, uh, uh, you know, circumstances now, companies may pay some form of, you know, compensation for, you know, like destroying a piece of land or polluting right. something. Some mitigation. Would, yes, effort. exactly. But again, food production is forever. So if one was to ask for mitigation uh, payments, for example, for lost production of food, that would essentially be something that, you know, there would be no time out on it. <laughs> essentially, as long as human beings lived and needed to, needed to feed themselves, then, you know, this would be a responsibility that's coming forward. And I, you know, you know talking to lots of um, politicians that I know in both countries, you know, a lot of them say, well, you know, that's just too far a leap. And I, I say, no, I actually, I don't think it's too far a leap at all. Um, you know, we, we've often made big leaps in how we treat natural landscapes. You know, for, for decades now, we believe that, you know, the best thing to do with our forested landscapes is to suppress every fire that we possibly can. Yeah. Well, I guess we're starting to realize where that brings us. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, but we did make well, a we big learned, decision yeah. to, to do it. And now we have to make a decision to, to move in a different direction. So I'm not a person who believes that massive change can't take, uh, cannot take place. Um, you know, most, uh, most political elites, they like to work within kind of smaller and more predictable chunks of change. But we all experience massive change, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has just suddenly, in the space of four months, transformed the world in which we live. So the, massive change comes The entire right. food supply of a lot of the yes. world is all of a sudden pivoted Absolutely. 180 degrees. Absolutely. And yeah. last November, if we'd had this discussion, we wouldn't even have been able to reference that. No. It's incredible to think about, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. So if if you were on in an elevator, yeah. and whether it's me a hunter or someone who's a non-hunter, yeah. I'm going to give you three sentences to explain the Wild Harvest Initiative. The Wild Harvest Initiative is the compilation of all of the wild food for all species in all regions of Canada and the United States that are harvested on an annual basis, broken down and determined as to how many actual meals are provided to how many people in our two countries as a result of hunting activity. Wow. Even, well, even if you are the beneficiary of the person because there's a lot of sharing that happens in this. And so that calculation isn't just the person doing the harvesting. No. There's the ripple effect of that. There is, and the ripple effect is massive. And one of the, one of the sub-programs in the Wild Harvest Initiative, if you will, is what we call the, the Meat Shearing Index. We, we promised all of our partners that we would develop this, this, this index, which really means we ask successful hunters in their region, states and provinces, you know, um, well, okay, how much did you harvest, first of all, you know, and we have all the calculations to know, that, you know, how many meals that re re results in and so on. But then we ask them, you know, and did you share your, your harvest, your wild harvest, your meat uh, with anyone? And uh, if so, who did you share it with? And of course, th these are showing just absolutely phenomenal results of you know, just a huge, huge majority of the of all of the hunters out there share their food. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of it is shared in their own household with right. their own family members. That's uh, sort of predictable. But there is a massive amount of food that's also shared with neighbors and friends, extended family. In other words, people who are not living in that same household. Yeah. And this is um, a vitally important component as well because... You know, I have many motivations for doing this, and you know, one of them is to is to demonstrate the beautiful parts of humanity that still arise whenever we immerse and enmesh ourselves or immerse ourselves in the natural world. We all understand how we feel when we're there, whether one is you know paddleboarding down the Missouri or whether one is you know fly fishing the Yellowstone or whether yeah. whatever one is doing. Um, but what we often forget is how much that influences our behavior towards one another. Um, and when it comes to the harvest of wild food, of course, traditionally human beings, hunter-gatherer societies, small numbers of people 
were the hunters. There wasn't everybody who went out and did right. all of this. There were always specialists who, who did it a little better than others. Um, but that meat was considered the, the meat of the community, right? Mm -hmm. It came back, it was shared with everybody, and it was shared in ways of understanding and metrics that were part of the culture of the particular group of humans uh, that we were talking about. And uh, we see these past inherited tendencies reflected all the time when we talk about natural things. And, you know, I've spoken about this before many times about how all of our phobias are really ancient, you know, heights and insects and snakes and <laughs> things that can frighten us. But, you know, we've never developed a phobia of cars, which kills, you know, which kills <laughs> gazillions of people, right? We've never developed phobias even about, even around firearms. We don't have firearm phobias. A lot of people die through firearms, obviously, unfortunately, but it's true. Um, no, uh, virtually every one of our phobias are coming from the past. There are a few psychological phenomena that can be explained as more recent, but even they, in my view, have historical yeah. past to them. And, you know, fear of strangers, you know, these kinds of things that, that develop. And, uh, and I think one of the other uh, extremely natural things is our, attractive, our attraction to certain ways in which food is is not only procured, but in ways food is treated and in the way food is cooked. So if Randy Newberg invites a group of people to his home and he's going to you know, cook something uh, that, is, that has meat in it, mm -hmm. um, and he does, that in his, um, he does that in his kitchen, you know, pulls down his oven door and he puts it in there and he put, you know, closes the door and leaves it there, well, everybody finds another room in which to sit and communicate and share stories and do what we do when we entertain people in our home. But if Randy is going to cook that over an open flame, uh, such as a barbecue or a, or a fire pit or, yep. or cook something on a spit or something of that nature, you know, we have this wonderful mixture of the sizzling and the dropping of fat and the smoke coming back from that as it lands on the coals and all this. Then, of course, there's nobody inside. They're all outside looking like there's some miracle taking place because this piece of animal is suddenly <laughs> being grilled in the open. <laughs> and it is kind of a miracle. Yeah, well, it is a miracle, actually, yes. But the point is that um, it's not the cooking of the food. It's the way in which the food is being cooked that elicits this kind of response from the human being. We sleep upstairs in our houses. Tree nests, the original way in which the, our forerunners as species, you know, you know, sought security. That's, that's where they went. There's no reason in the world why we should build our, 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 our bedrooms upstairs so consistently all over the place. But we do it. And so why do we do it? We do it because it's a form of security. I mean, this is... This is, this is what, we, what we like. We have fireplaces in our homes, even if we live in ridiculously warm places in the world, you know, and <laughs> everybody gets out and looks at that fire, even though it's, you know, 85 degrees in the room. These things, we cannot escape. Yeah. We have the most amazing technologies to give us any kind of lighting we want. Take a guess at how much money is spent on candles on this planet each year. I'm sure it's billions and billions yeah. and billions of dollars. Yeah. Why? Because that is actually a part of our past. And the part of our past that we're talking about is 95% of our past, or maybe 97% of our past. It's not 1% of our past. Yeah. Modernity is the little tiny percentage that we're dealing <laughs> with. Yeah. So it's just not over to overwhelm this. And so, you know, this issue of sharing wild harvests is something we're condemned to. And it extends beyond meat. We, we are now gaining the evidence through the Wild Harvest Initiative to actually show policymakers how much food is being produced by these activities and how much of that food is shared in the home economies. And then, of course, to be able to say how much this contributes, not replaces other forms of food, but contributes to the home food economy mm -hmm. and contributes to food security and contributes to human health by virtue of being out there harvesting yeah. this wild food, all of these things, which of course have, as we know, broad socioeconomic implications, such as reduced health declines, as, yeah. as, you know, all, all those all multiple benefits health, that are there. Yeah, yeah. And the sharing of the wild meat, therefore, is, 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 a, 
it's just one of these other beautiful expressions of how our natural selves still matter. It's also a beautiful expression of why hunting still matters deeply in society, whether some people are, you know, afraid of it, don't like it, or critical of it, whatever. It does have a profound place still in our modern society. And I think every person I know, um, you know, thinks highly of people who share what they have, yeah. whether they're really wealthy people or not really wealthy people. Everybody likes people who are kind and who share. Yeah. And so I think um, the demonstration of that in and of itself is something that is coming out of the Wild Harvest Initiative. And you have to remember, Randy, we never had any of this before. Mm-hmm. No one had ever looked at... I could not even go when I started this project. And I have a lot of colleagues in this business, both in academia and in the professional space and also personally and the recreational space, there was nobody I could call and ask the simple question, you know, how many species are we hunting? And, you know, well, you know, how much, what's the biomass of that harvest? And, and so on. And yet here we were, myself included, proclaiming the benefits of the North American model and, you know, the approaches that we've taken to sustainable use of yeah. wildlife in this country and in Canada. Um, and yet those basic statistics were... Out of reach. <laughs> Not uh, there. Yeah. Huh. So it was kind of uh, enlightening to, to understand that and then just, of course, gave more encouragement to me to, to continue this piece of work. But the sharing of this wild meat, which we are uncovering, if you think about it, you know, Randy never goes and buys a, a roast of beef at the grocery store and go, goes across the street to his neighbor and knocks on the door and says... Here, I'd like to give you this. <laughs> right? My neighbor would look at me in a strange way. Yes, I think so. But you can go over with a roast of elk yep. or, uh, you know, something from the animal that you give to that person. And they, they even if they're not a hunter, mm-hmm. they accept it quite naturally. And they say, well, thank you, Randy. God, that's fantastic. Yeah. And then they'll say something to you like, you know, I know exactly when we're going to have that. We're going to cook that when... Our daughter Mary is home from university this fall, or whatever yeah. it might be. Right. And mm. when you think about that further, you think about other wild harvests, like wild berries. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, it's almost an iconic demonstration of our, of our cultures, isn't it? The idea of, say, a grandmother with a pie that's made out of wild berries right? that's, <laughs> that's shared with people. These are, these are really, truly special human things, all of which are brought to full expression by food, yeah. wild food. No, you're, you're, it's, it's a you beautiful are, thing. It's like you are watching me from afar, Shane. <laughs> I, ha- I, I have That's the safest place, you know, yeah. watching from afar. <laughs> when you talk about all of this sharing... It puts a big smile on my face because sharing of all the harvest in my family, going back as far as I have memories, mm. was part of just what we did. And there were times we were the beneficiary the other direction where sure. someone, where I yep. grew up in northern Minnesota, wild blueberries are just yep. uh, well, yeah. carpets of them. Yeah, I know. And people would pick them. And they would come, and they'd know that my dad probably had some venison. Yeah. And the neighbor across the streets were very passionate and successful gardeners. Yeah. They didn't hunt much. Yeah, yeah. But my dad was kind of the neighborhood guy who did most of the hunting. And so I remember seeing that. And never did sharing happen also without a story. Of course not. Well, tell me how you got this fish or this deer Absolutely. or where did you get these berries? And then it would go into these stories about these wild landscapes. Yes. And to hear you say it, that this is just something that is in our DNA that probably is never going to leave our DNA. No. I don't feel so bad about spending a lot of time telling my neighbor, Kate, this venison I brought you, here's the story. Because I know she, she will ask it if I don't tell it. Yeah, no, I think this is true. But again, you know, this is a this is a recreation of, of our past. Uh, it's not only a recreation in, in any kind of false sense. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a re-realization uh, of our past. 
as I said, the idea of meat, uh, food, wild foods, and sharing, these were, these were you know, just uh, predetermined necessities of the biology of the human race. Uh, this is how it had to be. Mm -hmm. After all, we're nothing more than a, than a, you know, sort of a spectacular troop of monkeys. I mean, just, just, <laughs> I mean and, and, and that's all we really are, you know, and, and so we developed, you know, our, our, our own strategies and um, it, it was simply impossible for everyone to obtain all of their own food in the same way all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, people aged and were not as capable, for example, of doing some of the very mm -hmm. vigorous kind of things like hunting that was necessary. Um, women were, were often carrying pregnant with children and therefore their mobility would be affected to some extent because of course mm -hmm. women helped in the hunt always. And so there were always, and then there were tiny little humans running around, right? At, you know, yeah. they, they couldn't do uh, a great deal. So it was necessary that you know, people acquired this wild food and gave it to one another. And of course, then there was the collective realization in virtually every human culture that we know of, um, there was this you know, ceremonial uh, process when the food came back where you know, some greater force than themselves had to be thanked for providing this. Yeah, which uh, a god which you know, became had, religion. Which, yeah. Yes, which, which, which gave them something and of course, then this came to the stories of the idea that the animal gave itself to them for this purpose, right? And, and all of these things are um, critically important to understanding that when you are motivated to share your, your elk or your rabbits or your rainbows or whatever it might be, um, you, you probably are a very generous man. Uh, but you also are operating as a natural man where maybe the term is not so much generosity as it was this beautiful necessity and that this is what we're living out again yeah. and again and again. It's amazing to be, you know, over an animal as big as a, as a bull moose and to be eviscerating that animal, you know, the heat rising from it, the, the scent once the, yeah. you know, once the, once the innards are exposed and you're, you know, you're, you're cutting through a breastbone and you're doing all of that and with a moose, you usually have at least one person with you to help because yes, he's, a hopefully. he's a fairly big uh, problem once he falls. It's like people say at home in Newfoundland, all the fun is over once he drops, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so, um, you know, but you're doing that, and at the same time that you're talking about things and you know, doing various things to clean the animal up, um, you're already talking about. Well, I got to make sure now. I, I, I have to give Uncle George, uh, you know, a, a roast, and I, I may even give you know the back straps this year to somebody or something yeah. like this, you know. And this is um, this is part two of the story that you know we as hunters must become much more inclined to tell and, and feel much freer in telling. You know, in other words, these experiences as to how that wild food came into our possession and what we may have experienced as a result of being there. You mentioned blueberry harvesting is a very big thing in Newfoundland as well. It's a wild berry harvesting is huge anyway, always has been. But you know, you know sometimes when you go berry picking, you know, you don't see too much wildlife. You might see you might see a moose, or you you might see some chickadees. You might see some black and white warblers. You might see a few other small passerines, things of this nature. But you know, you can also be harvesting blueberries on coastal margins, and suddenly just look outwards over the ocean, and suddenly you know there's these whales just moving back and forth across that landscape, that watered landscape that's out there, and you know, uh, and seabirds, you know making their own way in that space. And so even even something as genteel almost as berry picking, mm -hmm. you can still have an extraordinary experience in nature that extends beyond that food. And of course, as every hunter knows, you know, every every day hunting is a day of exploration. Yeah. Right. Oh, whether yeah. you see the animal you are looking for or whether you do not. But it's yeah. and so it's a um there are so many dimensions of this, you know, 
we, we view it now, all of the partners that are involved and conservation visions in this effort, we, we view it now as a kind of series of concentric circles. You know, it starts with the idea of quantifying just how much wild food we are harvesting and radiates out from there to the issues of, you know, how much we share uh, that wild food with and who are the people that we share that wild food with. And then you start to think about all the different kinds of wild foods and you suddenly start to bring all of that together, you know, in, a, in a, an incredibly advanced, industrialized, wealthy society still, this is an enormous contributor to regional economies mm -hmm. and to regional food economies. And within each one of those concentric circles, how much meat, you know, how much is shared, etc., there are all these separate kinds of investigations that can go on. Well, let's take how much is harvested. Well, what is that worth? Yeah, if the you, economic value. Yeah, and what actually worth if you were to sell it tomorrow, for yeah. example, or something like that, or in reverse, if you were in terms to of what you buy it. Yes, because you didn't have that, then you have to go buy something comparable. So we're looking at all of those questions and saying, well, okay, let's say a person who harvests an elk or a moose or a caribou, uh, mule deer or whatever, uh, let's say they're most inclined, if they didn't have that, to buy beef mm -hmm. or pork, right. beef and pork, whatever. And so we are now assessing the value of the wild harvested meat based on the economics of alternative kinds of meat that people will be most likely to procure. Yeah. And... Um, you know, we are talking, when it's all collected, billions of pounds of, of wild food. And we're talking, you know, many, many billions of dollars in terms of value in, in that sense. And some people will say, well, you know, it might in fact be cheaper, you know, uh, for a lot of people to go and buy their beef at the store. And I like beef. I mean, this is not, yeah. uh, you know, something against... Uh, against cattle. Um, but we have to think about it much more broadly than that because the person who goes to harvest an animal, that person is also paying for a license fee or a permit. Mm -hmm. That person is also paying, depending on the gear they purchase and so on, they're paying excise taxes, federal taxes, that, and all of those things, the permit fees and the excise taxes and so on, they all go into direct revenue sources for state agencies for the management of all wildlife, not just game species. Um, and that's not true when I buy a, a roast <laughs> at the grocery store. No. Uh, and in addition to that, all of the gear that everybody buys, whether it's, you know, a good camouflage clothing or rain gear or tents, or, but not or all of those kinds yeah. of things. These, this, is, this, is, this is enormous. And while there is a small percentage, really, if you look at the data. There's another big study we're about to launch. But if you look at the data, it's a relatively small percentage of people who harvest wildlife who are not significantly or fundamentally interested in the meat. They may be interested in other things. Most hunters have multiple motivations oh, yeah. for being out there, mm -hmm. right? But one of the basic motivations is food. And even our earliest laws associated with North American conservation said, you know, you will only take an animal, as we talked about on the, the podcast that we did on the North American model for legitimate purpose. And of course, one thing you will never do is you will never waste that animal. Yeah. You will never shoot an elk and leave it on that land and just say, oh, I was a successful hunter. You know, I killed an elk. Right. That simply will not happen. And uh, I think these, uh, all of these ideas together you know, when you trace them all back, a lot of the many benefits that have come to us individually as people who hunt in terms of our communities and the food sharing that has gone on, the support for local economies, particularly in parts of our countries where generating, you know, jobs and income is not that easy to do, which are the very places we go to pursue, pursue our hunting and fishing. When you add all of that up, the actual contribution is, 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 is simply incredible. And previous to this, we had some idea about the number of jobs created in rural America as a result of hunting or mm -hmm. things of this nature. But we could never fully evaluate what the real benefit of this, this hunting phenomenon was if we could not 
also evaluate what was the value of the, the food itself, one of the most primary motivations, and historically the motivation, yep. of course, for hunting in the first instance. As a result of the Wild Harvest Initiative, we are going to be bringing forward that holistic understanding of the socioeconomic value of this activity, while at the same time <clears throat> conducting massive global searches now for the medical research that uh, is arising everywhere that's talking about the actual health benefits of being in the outdoors in general and yeah. wild meat consumption, et cetera. Yeah. Well, before we get into the North American model and how we have institutions, if you want to call it that, in our countries that are working towards the sustainability of this. As you were talking, I'm trying to think in my head because I've lived a life assuming this abundance would always be there for me, mm -hmm. that my food security could always be relied upon in the natural world. Mm -hmm. For a minute, I just want to envision what would happen to people and to nature if tomorrow wild harvest was no longer part of the picture? Well, it's a, it's a profound and a really important question, and I'm glad you asked it, Randy, because um, where a lot of people's minds might go uh, initially, uh, all of us would might go initially to that as well, there's going to be this direct impact on you know, the food economy in Randy Newberg's household, or mm -hmm. the food economy in Shane Holmes' household. Um, and that's absolutely true. But we would lose so much more. As I've said, this harvesting of wild food opens up a gateway to an extraordinary past for our own species, which represents, as I said, 95 to 97 percent of our entire time on the planet as a species. Mm -hmm. was, that was the central kind of idea, you know. That was your we hunted and we, we gathered. And yeah. then we became, after a while, pretty darn good at, at agriculture. Native Americans were tremendous agriculturalists, of course, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's not only opening up something that helps us understand who we were, what we were in the past, that we will only gain through those experiences and our mind will only turn to those things when, when we are in that circumstance of gathering wild things. But all of these other things that tie us together as people, you know, first of all, all that sharing would go away. Yeah. And there would never be a discussion around the dinner table of, you know, how that particular piece of meat ended up on that plate in the center of the table. Like, no one is going to get there and say, well, you know, I actually bought this pork roast yesterday <laughs> at, you know, whatever your famous grocery store line might be in Montana. And then go back to explain how, you know, at one time he was a little piglet and he lived, in, <laughs> he lived a long way away and then he took a long truck drive. And, you, know, you know, we're never going to have those stories, really. So, you know, all of these stories that might be told about, I don't know just something you saw when you were in pursuit of that particular animal or, um, you know, the quality of, of, of the animal when, when you began to eviscerate and clean it up, you see how healthy that, that animal was, that kind of thing, that you could judge yourself, not only that this was a wild meat, but that it came from an animal of a, of a certain class, of a certain age, of a certain location. And you could tell by looking at that animal, you know, how it had fed and that it had fed well and that it didn't have injuries or it might have had injuries or all of these kinds of personalized stories about that. Um, we would lose all of those kinds of things. And the, the sharing, as I said, goes way beyond wild meat. It's about wild berries. It's about wild mushrooms. It's about, you know, yeah, all these kinds of Yeah, of course. And then you see all of these images, you know, as we have in many of our uh, communication materials for the wild harvest. You know, you see these beautiful images of, um, you know, of young couples with little tiny humans with them that are out there, you know, filling baskets with wild mushrooms and, or little buckets with wild berries or things of this nature. And um, you suddenly realize that, um, okay, all of that goes away. And, and that doesn't happen anymore. 
And then, of course, you start to think about, well, okay, let's say all of that harvesting of wild rice and of wild leeks and of medicinal plants and of, uh, you know, wild rices and wild mushrooms and wild honey and maple syrup and, you know, there is a big list when you start yeah. to think about it, right? <laughs> All of that goes away, and every one of those experiences goes away. And I keep reminding people, because I come from a very unique culture. There's a, there's a, a complete and utter sense of identity as a Newfoundlander. You, you are not a Canadian, really. You're a Newfoundlander. Uh, and the ties between the place and Newfoundlanders, and everyone who has ever met one will tell you this, you can have... Newfoundlanders in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who moved from Newfoundland 20 or 30 years ago or 40 or 50 years ago because they had to find work somewhere else. And they will still become extraordinarily emotional talking about the place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's this sense of identity that people have, an identity of a culture here in Montana, identity of a culture in, in Louisiana. There are many cultures subcultures within yeah. the culture of the United States of America. Um, you know, the question for me is, um, how many pieces do you take out of a culture? How many of these things, like these images of these families harvesting mushrooms or hunters harvesting wildlife or people on the river, you know, harvesting fish or and, and the meals that are shared and the pies that are baked and the stories that are told and the neighbors that are reached out to and the, and the maybe even differences of opinion that suddenly come to be understood more clearly because somebody shares wild food with a neighbor or a friend and, you know, you had a fight last week over you parked your car too close to the driveway <laughs> or something, you know. You know, I mean, all these things happen, right? Yeah, and, and so you, you, you think about that and I always liken this to an aircraft, you know, I spent a lot of time in small aircraft in particular with my research work for years. And, you know, you were always, uh, you know, when you'd look out the window, you know, the rivets were clear. You know, you could see how this thing was put together. It's not like the big jets, you yeah. know, you don't really know. But, <laughs> but, you know, you're flying around in a Super Cub, or you're flying around in a Beaver or a Cessna or something like that. You can, you can pretty well figure out how it was made. And you look at these rivets, and, you know, I always felt, you know, well, just imagine if you're up there at six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 feet, whatever you're flying at, you know, tracking caribou, whatever it might be, and all of a sudden those rivets start to pop. <laughs> well, you know, you can pop one, you can pop two, you can pop 10, you can pop 100, you can pop maybe 2,000, and everything will be fine. But eventually you're going to pop enough of those rivets that those damn wings are going to fall off. Yeah. And you are going straight down on a long ride. Yeah. Cultures are like that. Yeah. You can take, you know, things change over time and certain things are lost over time. But if you lose too many of those rivets, those cultural rivets, eventually you don't have a culture left. Yeah. And for me, as I said, uh, you know, over many years of talking about hunting, um, you know, it is... Um, it is something that shaped us. And if it disappeared tomorrow, it would still be of incredible importance to me because it has explained so much to me of what humanity is. Yeah, me too. You know, so even if it disappeared. But the important thing, of course, is to not let it disappear. And we have great challenges that way. And I thought that the North American model, for example, was one great way of, you know, maintaining the cultural identity and the, and the drive to make sure that this did not go away. And I think that was true, I think, to an extent. I think it did help in that regard and does. And now I think this idea of wild food is the next big step. Because I do not believe we can expect to retain recreational hunting anywhere in the world if it is not fundamentally focused on food. food. Yeah. There may be some peripheral small exceptions for certain kind of international hunting circumstances or whatever, but 
you know, when we're talking about the majority, the kind of thing that will keep something living for a long period of time, the substrate it needs, this idea of procuring wild food is going to be the only thing that will maintain it. Because people say, well, you know, we'd always have, you know, overpopulations of animals and somebody would have to take care of that. That's not hunting, first of all. That is culling. And yes, you can hire sharpshooters to go out and kill you know, too many elk. You don't like how many whitetails you got. You go out and do that kind of stuff. Yeah. But that doesn't end up with somebody walking across the street and saying, hey, Kate, you know, here, here's, here's your roast for this year. You know, yeah. all, all that stuff goes away. It's, it's a completely, utterly different kind of circumstance. It has no real bearing. And the interesting thing about that proposition, Randy, that, and I am convinced of this, I think this Wild Harvest Initiative and all of the ideas surrounding it, not just my ideas, but the bigger picture ideas that we all contribute to, I think this is the only thing that is going to carry us forward into the middle of, the next, of this century and beyond with mm -hmm. regard to hunting. I think it could even increase the participation in hunting because of the yeah. benefits of food. And also, when you look at the broad public's um, support or feelings about the hunting activity, there is a statistic that in and of itself demonstrates all of these things we've already talked about, about how historically relevant this is and how it comes from our past. Since the 1950s, so that's, let's say, 70, 70 years, yeah. 70 yeah. years Surveys have been conducted at various scales, public opinion surveys at various scales in the United States of America on people's views of hunting. Mm -hmm. And since the 1950s, um, you know, there has been a consistent trend for the public of the United States of America, and this is largely true in Canada as well to at a rate of between about 74 to 81, 82 percent to say, we agree with regulated, legal, sustainable hunting. But the caveats are those high numbers of support, they come when it's really about the specific question of somebody harvesting the animal for a purpose and the purpose being food. Yeah. If you said, do you agree with legal hunting and the only thing that everyone was going to take from the animal, let's say, was its, its, its antlers or its, its horns it's or whatever, yeah. then, of course, the support for that would go down to maybe 20% or 30% or something of this nature. Now, the question you have to ask yourself when you see statistics like that is why? 3.5% of Americans... Uh, I think that's the number now about where we are, and it's about right. the same in Canada. Yeah. You know, participate in hunting activity. That's a, that's, it's pretty small. You know? <laughs> really and, small. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you compared it with something like you know bigger pastimes, like you know drinking beer or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a pretty small, a pretty small percentage. So how is it then that seventy-five to eighty percent of the people don't hunt have? for over 70 years, really since we've been asking them, mm -hmm. uh, have this enormous level of support for hunting and also have, of course, the most extraordinary level of support for hunting when it is around food. Yeah. This is our past calling us. This is what this is. <laughs> Those people may not hunt, but they have an understanding that, you know, the provision of food and the harvesting of wild things for food that is an honorable thing. That is not something I should condemn as a part of society. You know, this is, this is bringing real benefits to people in different ways. Yeah. And so if we ever, if we ever make the mistake of disfiguring that support, of no longer earning that support by developing hunting practices, for example, or showing, you know, showing hunting in a light that, it, that, it, that, that that's wrong and where, that it shouldn't be shown in, we run the risk of having, um, we'll lose that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, Randy, once we lose that, 
Well, it's it's done. Right. Well, saying is do not return. No, they, mm. they 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 will never come back because, of course, you have to learn. Yeah. Whether it's to find mushrooms or to find blueberries. Right. Or elk. Yeah. And for me, that's why it's so hard. Going back to my question of what would this look like if it ended tomorrow? Yeah. What would it mean for people? Well, you've painted a very colorful explanation of what my life, as you were saying that, my life, that's how my life would change dramatically. The natural world, the landscape that gives me so much connection, so much sanity, if you want to call it that, yeah. so much mental health, physical health, yeah. would be changed totally in, in a huge way. So it's, it's not the place I want my mind to go, but if you're going to treasure something and you value something, you have to look at the antithesis of that. Uh, sure you do. What if I didn't have it? Yeah. And that gives it even more value when you have to look at it that way. It does. I think that's absolutely true. And I think people need to realize something. Um, I was approached uh, a few weeks ago by somebody who heard me give a lecture about 15 or 16 years ago um, at an event in Idaho. And he just wrote me in talking about this and said, I really want to thank you for this particular lecture, but the point is that the lecture was about don't think you can't lose it. And I used the Newfoundland seal hunt as an illustration, mm -hmm. something that was vitally important to our culture. I mean, it was, it was you know, like lions to the Maasai. I mean, <clears throat> this was... This was just something for 350 years that was absolutely a part of our identity. You know, the absolute most dangerous hunt in the world. There's nothing even close in this world today that, 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 that came, even came close to the danger of, of you know, hunting seals um, out on a floating carpet of constantly moving ice on ocean swells that were often rising 12 to 18 feet at the same time, um, and you had to hop from pan to pan. And if you missed once and you went in that water, you're fortunate if your friend using the gaff, which was that sort of like bat-like thing with the hook in it that we had, you know, you, you know, if that hook got into your clothing or into your flesh and you got pulled back on the ice, well, you had a chance to live. And if not, of course, you sank into the black deep brine and that was the end of you. And Hundreds and hundreds of people died on ships that were lost as a result of storms and people lost on the ice and died and perished in one another's arms on the on the ice flows. Fathers and sons, you know, died together and brought home frozen together, you know, and their bodies had to be put in tubs of water to thaw them out so that they could bury them. And these are the kinds of experiences and the food and the amount of, the chance for some money and the chance in a place without agriculture for some red meat in a, in a, in a winter season. All mm -hmm. those kinds of things and all the culinary traits around it and all the songs and all the stories and all of that. And when the protesters came, you know, 40 years ago to first condemn us for this activity, um, you know, we just initially, of course, thought they were Martians, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, where did yeah, these they, people they, come they, from? They just, I mean, they've just ascended, you know, they, you know, there must be a little rocket ship behind the, <laughs> behind the hill there, and they, they you know, they, 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 they'll, be, they'll go back for some green cheese soon or something, you know? <laughs> But anyway, you know, the bottom line is, you know, this thing rolled on and it rolled on, and it rolled on and it rolled on, and through a course of many fights and many counter fights and the raising of huge amounts of money and so on and so forth, ultimately culminating in the decision of the European Union to ban seal imports and close the marketing possibilities for us. While we retain a very small activity, it has gone from being an, an iconic driver of Newfoundland identity uh, to something that is, um, you know, it's, it's maintained, but it's to some extent on life support system. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, your point is that, of course, you can lose it. There is nothing that cannot be lost, uh, you know, that we treasure if it is not carefully looked upon, carefully thought about, and carefully shepherded in society, whether that is basic freedoms or whether that is, you know, cultural activities that we value deeply. 
And, um, and when we ponder the loss of wild harvesting, and in particular when we think about it relative to where we might bring it, Randy, how we might expand it, uh, how we might see it as a way of helping indigenous and tribal peoples and non-indigenous and non-tribal peoples understand perspectives of one another better around this idea of food and wild harvesting, which has been so important to, to, to all of us who participate in those activities. There are so many dimensions that we just do not think about on a daily basis. And when I came up with this idea, you know, I was sort of thinking about you know, okay, the, the the North American model is out there. There are lots of people talking about mm -hmm. it now. It's got its proponents and some detractors. Uh, it's in academic circles. It's in law in some cases. It's with many, many, many policies. It's the it's the mantra now that's used by the state agencies and the provincial agencies. Yeah. And that we did all that. That that happened. Um, and but is that enough to maintain what is one of the central elements? of this whole North American conservation system that, that we have, uh, which is, of course, this issue of, of wild harvesting. And the answer is, it's not quite enough. We have to emphasize what, what were the, actually the benefits. The recovery of wildlife, that's, that's yeah. a benefit, clearly. Sure. People can say, you know, we had very few elk, we have more. We had very few whitetail, we have more. There are those kinds of things. But then the question that came to me, and sort of being my own critic, if you will, of the model, so what? So, okay, there's a lot more wildlife, and that's on the surface of the beautiful. What does that mean? Well, that means we can see more wildlife. That's, that's fantastic. Look at the, I don't know, 23 million visitors, the Yellowstone. <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> Whatever yeah, it's it is. a large there. number. You know, I mean, uh, you know, that is valuable. But then this idea of wild food which is, um, has proven over time for many cultures to be, you know, their absolute defining sense of identity. The, you know, the, the, the plains, the, the, the Native Americans who, who, you know, so wondrously adopted this new animal, the horse, from the Spanish and, and went on to become, as the U.S. cavalry officers themselves said, uh, simply the best cavalry in the world, you know, yeah. the, the Native American rider. Um, you know, uh, to them, whether it was the buffalo, the bison, or whether it was, uh, you know, their coastal traditions of living off, off the, the sea mammals and, and fish and so forth, whether they were brilliant agriculturalists that, you know, saved the lives of many early Europeans who came and couldn't survive the winters and but were fed by the stores that were provided by the Native Americans. You know, food has always been at the heart of a sense of identity. And, you know, you don't have to spend very much time in a place like Bozeman or in Montana generally without you get that very strong sense of things, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and yet here we are. It's the year 2022. We're not talking, you know, the year two or, right. the, or the year 10, 22 <laughs> or or something, uh, and we came out of Africa 70,000 years ago, approximately as a species. And so for the, f for the first, you know, for the first 60,000 years, for the rise of agriculture, um, it was really all about this hunting and gathering lifestyle. Yeah. So how many things do we believe, you know, arose during that time that arose because of hunting? Art, technology, technology first, how to butcher things, how to kill things. And then the ideas of art, you know, the great carvings and the great parietal art of, of, of the European caves and so on. I mean, that was started 30,000 years ago and continued up wow. to 12,000. For 18,000 years, people were going into these caves and painting, creating these absolute masterpieces. I mean, they showed Picasso and they asked him what he, what he thought of it. He said... We've invented nothing in art. That's what he said after he, 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 he witnessed this. So, you know, all of those kinds of things emerged because we had well-developed religions, of course. We had well-developed art. We had well-developed technology. 
three of the things that define humanity the most, those mm -hmm. three things. Um, they all developed in that period. Uh, and so this little time period we live in now has not only inherited these traditions of food and sharing and all of that, but every art museum I go to, and I go to a lot of them, I love art, every time I see a new piece of technology, when I see Rover on Mars, you know, every time I see or learn about a, some particular aspect of, of a person's faith, and there are many faiths in the world, um, I know, I know that while we all have our, you know, our, our prophets, our, our, our important religious people who led those particular uh, belief systems, I know that every one of them arose in our historic past. Every single one of them arose in our historic past from the idea of why we interred our dead, why we, why we began to bury people, uh, to the idea of resurrection, why we believe that if we, if we buried someone and we buried them with their f favorite horse or with their dog, you know, and we gave them some weapons to carry and some food, some pemmican maybe in a small yeah. deerskin pouch, um, that they would actually rise and they would go to live somewhere else and they would, they would be a part of something. I mean, those ideas, for example, are 30,000 years ago and 20,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago, thousands of years before the, the mainstream, we might say, religions of today were actually developed. Yeah. Where did they come from? They came from the oral speakings. And until we started to write things down, that was the only way that it could come to them. And so, again, had we been leaf eaters, we would not have needed technology. We would have been just like the amazing mountain gorilla. We would just would have used our hands to pick leaves and put them into our mouths and to chew them. And, and, and there's so much of that food, we wouldn't have had to roam all that far. We would have just just been around in small patches and small <laughs> troops and done happily done all of that kind of thing and lived in our little high nests and so on and so forth. It is unimaginable that we would have uh, created art uh, had that been the case. In all of the parietal settings, the, the parietal art is the cave art itself, not, not the mobiliar art, the art you can carry. This is the art that's in place on the, yeah. on, on the walls. Um, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know if there is a single uh, figure of a of a plant, certainly not in Western Europe, or of a sunrise, or of a, I don't know, you know, beautiful seascape. I mean, these, what it was was the animals. Yep. That's and that's what it was. Animals and humans, and even the humans, in that art, are simply little stick humans, like a, a, a <laughs> child would draw, right? It's a little like I pencil would body, like two legs and two <laughs> arms, and then there's the animals, and they're there and they're their beauty turning, fighting, you know, dripping blood where they have been wounded, you know, their eyes open just like when you see elk fighting and all, all these wonderful things that any hunter can, can relate to having experienced it. Um, and this is all, all of it driven by our hunting past. And you see it expressed every convention you go to that deals with hunting when you start to look at the, the furniture and the jewelry, you know, that, that's made the, the antlered lamps and, right. you know, the beautiful chairs and beautiful earrings and necklaces and rings and tie things and so forth. And that's all directly, it's so directly connected, right? Yeah. And Voyager is directly connected to the first people who, and they long before our modern form, who broke stone tools to butcher animals. And that goes back two million years. Wow. I have two hand axes from Tanzania uh, that are 350,000 years old. 
Whoa. And uh, I mean, you can see, you know, how they fit into the palm of your hand and how the flaking is done for actually cutting and crushing bones and separating bones, you know, by cutting the, for cutting the tendons and so, yeah. and so forth. And so this wild harvest thing, to me, it's all about all of that. And that's why, in a sense, I think it's almost more important than the model in terms of the stories we're going to be able to tell coming out of it going forward. Yeah. And I think that, uh, I think that we need to realize that ultimately it was our procurement of food and the way we went about that that ultimately made us the animals we are. And that includes perhaps some negative things, Randy, too. Mm -hmm. We're complicated creatures. But it certainly includes many of the things that we most love and admire in this world. I am sure that perhaps somebody who is capable of owning, you know, the masterpieces of art in this world are unlikely to be thinking when they look at a Rembrandt uh, or a Picasso, for example, and they look at that, I'm sure they're not thinking about where all of this capacity came from. But there's no question in my mind that it was our intimate, natural relationship with the natural world and this hunter-gathering lifestyle. And we know that the people who are creating this art historically were hunter-gatherer people. There's no debating that whatsoever. Um, but I think this is where all of this comes from. And I think uh, as further to that, as we started to pursue wild things and began to become the greatest walkers uh, in the animal kingdom, and human beings are, we are the, the best walkers in, mm -hmm. in the entire animal kingdom. We walked around the world, for God's sake. You know, <laughs> that's essentially what we did. Uh, you know, literally. Um, so many of the talents that we have um, relating to another really important aspect of our modern culture also came from, was derived from these food procurement practices. And I'm speaking of athletics. Um, if you imagine, um, if you imagine a quarterback um, in a particular setting in the game. First of all, he's, he's looking out on essentially a natural scape. It's all green, right? Yeah. It's, it's a field of grass, essentially. And he has a projectile in his hand. And he knows, by knows, he consciously knows the weight of that. He knows the capacity of his arm and shoulder and lower back and legs to move that missile a certain distance. He has to understand what wind there may be, if there is any in that particular setting, and the light. He has to watch down this line of moving animals that are chaotically running around just like frightened animals might be when you're hunting them. He has to pick out that one specific animal that he's decided that he is going to hit with this projectile. He's going to wait until that animal is coming predictably into a certain space. And then he is going to throw that in a way that perfectly intercepts the movement of that particular animal. Now I can assure you that if we had stayed as leaf eaters, there would be no NFL today. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Brady would not be the most Tom famous Brady athlete would not, in America. No. But he probably would have been, I suspect, just like most of these superb athletes, whether it's in basketball, football, hockey, it doesn't really matter. But most of these superb athletes, of course, they have certain talents. They have extraordinary um, agility. They have extraordinary hand-eye or, or eye-foot coordination, depending, you know, if we're talking soccer. Um, and they have um, an enormous uh, ability to read a, a very variable uh, space around them that is filled with movement and exciting potential distractions, which they have to completely ignore in order to be able to accomplish the mission that, they, that they're set out upon. And um, 
there is just no doubt in my mind that almost all of them would have excelled as hunters for those reasons. Yeah. And of course, some of them have great speed, right? So they can run down things. You know, there's all of these, all of these talents became uh, incredibly important when you hunted. But again, had you remained as a leaf eater, they, wouldn't they, they wouldn't, they, we wouldn't have needed them at all. They wouldn't have been, they would have had really no value to us. We could simply sit and feed ourselves on leaves. So all of this, to me, is what this Wild Harvest Initiative is really about. It's, um, it's about wild food. It's about the fact that we're so fortunate to be able to live in a time and a place where we can still legally undertake these the activities that we do that we can provide food for our families that we know is absolutely the healthiest food that can be procured there's no question about that these right. purely natural systems provide this beautiful food and despite all of the challenges that we have faced it is you know and some of the problems that have been created it is still in those spaces and for those species that we have a desire to harvest, whether that's marine fishes or whether it's wildlife on the land. They, they have become priorities for us. Yeah, for me. And for some people say too much of a priority because, you know, <laughs> they're the hunted species. But, they, but, but no one can deny that they have become a priority for us and that despite, you know, many excesses in the past where we have done things that were not good for wildlife, we, we have shown ourselves capable the world over of doing absolutely amazing things from, with science and with understanding of the natural system to be able to enable us to sustain things, uh, to harvest things in a sustainable way. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. That's remarkable in today's world. It is, really. Yeah. That's not to say we don't have our problems. <laughs> no, we do. <laughs> We've got plenty to work on. Well, Jane. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, well, it's job security, Randy. You know, I mean, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Shane, we've been really laying a lot of groundwork here for what Wild Harvest is, uh, the Wild Harvest Initiative, and one of the, if you want to say, linkages for sustainability, for how policy gets adapted or adopted, uh, how science is used, is this thing, at least in the U.S. and Canada, that we call the North American model of wildlife conservation. So it, I'm sure the audience is like, well, when are you, you're bouncing around here. And mm -hmm. it, is it just because they're, the, I don't want to say inseparable, but w one supports the other in such a manner that they're good parallel discussions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they are inseparable in my mind. Um, you know, the, the, ultimately the, the motivation of, of hunters, and this is a, a strange to me that this is um, so seldom identified because it's, it's so clear to me, the basic motivation of the hunter is to possess. He or she wishes to possess that wild thing. Mm -hmm. And this, this partly explains, of course, why some hunters will tell you that, you know, there was, a, there was a moment there after he or she died that if I could have, I, I might have reversed it all. And this is another insight to this world of possession we have always wondered about possessing these wild things, and that's why there were laws in Roman Greek times about whether you could or could not possess the wild things. Mm -hmm. They were res nullius, as they were known in Roman law. No one could possess them. They were wild. But the mere fact that there had to be laws to talk about the fact that you could not possess them because they were wild meant there was this desire to possess. And it's like, it's like a child, like as a young boy, when I would be capturing bumblebees, or I'd be capturing moths, or I'd catch mice, or I'd be catching small birds, or whatever, and sticklebacks, you know, to keep little trout and frogs and things of this nature. It was all to possess them, because they weren't being killed, of course. They were just being caught and mm -hmm. looked at in a jar or kept in a sausage can or whatever it might <laughs> be, you know. Um, 
And so this idea of pursuing wildlife and motivations to do it, and there are many, as we've talked about, motivations. And possession can mean seeing in some ways, just being able to, to get close to view them, you know, to get close enough to smell them. That, in a way, is almost a possession, but it doesn't quite fit fully. Um, that aspect of our behavior is very much buried, of course, in this idea of the North American model. Mm -hmm. The idea that, number one, we wanted to maintain wildlife at all in the first instance. Why? Why did we want to maintain wildlife? Why, why not get rid of it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, the Jeffersonian ideal was, you know, uh, every s small farmer with his plot of land and you didn't like bears and you didn't like coyotes, and you didn't like mountain lions, you didn't like deer because they ate your crops and so on, yeah. you know? So why not just essentially get rid of all this? But no, there, there was this overall drive, this social revolution to, to keep them with us. But again, it wasn't just to keep them with us, was it? Because one of the cornerstones of that model was that hunting would be allowed and hunting would even, to some extent, be encouraged. And, but under some circumstances, it had to be you know, allocated by law and you had to have a permit or license right. or whatever to do it and you could only use certain weapons to hunt certain species and things of this nature. So this idea, therefore, of maintaining wildlife and maintaining wildlife for purpose. Food wasn't the only purpose, but that was a major purpose for right. maintaining wildlife. These things have been uh, inseparably linked. And of course, when you think about part of the motivation, you know, one of the great global searches in conservation is to find programs that when they work, incentivize the individuals working in them to keep doing what they're doing, right? right? Yeah. Um, and so by giving a value to wildlife, of course, of whatever value that might be, just to see them in the Serengeti or to hunt them and harvest them in many communities in Africa, Europe, elsewhere in the world, North America, and so on, this is a way of incentivizing people to keep them. And a big part of that utilization, particularly here in the United States and Canada, was and remains for food, yeah. as it is in Europe. Yeah. I mean, these animals are eaten, as it is in South Africa. The animals are eaten, etc. Namibia. And so, when we think about this and this idea of incentives, it also raises a point that's also very seldom ever discussed by anyone with regard to the North American model, but brings in this question of how are they related. We are incentivized to maintain particularly uh, those species that are food provisioning, mm -hmm. the ungulates in particular, right. right? There is no question that we have invested very heavily in that as we have in waterfowl. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by investment? Well, just think about the number of non-governmental organizations volunteer based in some cases and then become big enough that they have staff and so on and so forth that do so much work, raise so much money. And the total purpose, the total endpoint, the goal of doing it is to keep these wild animals with us. We have the Ducks Unlimiteds of the world and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundations of the world and the Wild Sheep Foundations of the world and so on and so yeah. forth. And then in the international space, we have uh, uh, organizations that work uh, to, uh, to promote uh, conservation of species. The incentive and the incentivizing of the North American hunter, you know, has reached a state that is unparalleled anywhere. There is no comparison compared to what's happened with in Canada and the United States. And between those two countries, the United States has a, an effort like this relative to Canada's. I mean, mm -hmm. the number of NGOs in this country yeah. is just right. it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's off the charts. And, and many of the groups, of course, that eventually have chapters and influence in, in, in Canada actually quite a number of them, you know, developed here in, in, in this country and then developed mm -hmm. outposts, if you will, in, in, in Canada. And so the, the connection is not only that food is a primary motivation for hunters to do what they do, 
And not only is it important because of the sharing that we have conducted, discussed earlier, it's also vitally important because it is part of what incentivizes the hunting public to go way beyond what it might be considered necessary. We could have a system, Randy, where hunters bought game permits mm -hmm. and you know went out and harvested their waterfowl or their elk or whatever it might be, and paid for their you know paid their excise taxes, paid for that permit, and therefore contributed to to wildlife and said, "That's great, you know I, I'm legal. I get to hunt. Um, I love to do it. I, I get this beautiful wild food. I share it. All that takes place. Not one part of that." And this is something that most people dealing with the realities of North American conservation today fail to realize. Not one iota of that series of linkages mm -hmm. required hunters to form all of these other organizations. It sure. could have went on just quite happily. Mm -hmm. Could have went on just quite happily. You could have been still hunting. Everybody could still be legal. It could be all permitted and so on and so forth. Instead of that, these hunting organizations began to arise as early as in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, they arose and then continued to arose, and they went all the way from duck hunting clubs to little fishing clubs to whatever, all the way up to some of these mega institutions that we have today that operate and which have raised hundreds of millions of dollars collectively. Maybe it's billions, right? Yeah. If you, to add it all up, you know, and it's all gone just to help wildlife. Yeah. How remarkable. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and if you travel to Europe, you can go where you like in Europe. Those organizations don't exist. Really? And they often ask me, well, how, how, how did you form that thing? Because they've heard of something like Ducks Unlimited, perhaps. Yeah. You know, it's a big enterprise. So how, how, did, how did that form? And you, you start to explain to them what the, what the basic motivation was. Um, and it's just sort of foreign to the way that they have tended to operate. And so the connections between wild harvesting and the motivation for the hunter to continue to do it led not just to the acceptance and even the lobbying for appropriate game laws, as they were known, but also spread out into this extraordinary philanthropic volunteerism, you know, um, charitable foundation, organizational behemoth that exists in the United States of America. It may be true that some of them are a little bit competitive with one another, you know, because we're, right. we're, we're, we're troops of humans and we always got a little bit of tribalism going on. But in the end, the motivations were were very much largely the same. It's also true, of course, that it's not only hunters who've developed organizations for That's nature, right. but mm -hmm. we're talking about this particular aspect here of the procurement of wild food. Mm -hmm. So I think that the uh, one could ask, could the North American model exist, for example, without the hunting community? Well, if you try to answer that question, you have to think about all of those things that I've just raised, the amount of money that's put in, the amount of volunteerism, the amount of private money that is raised and given to wildlife circumstances. So let's say it all goes away. It all goes away tomorrow. That's no longer there. And all, all, all that money is gone. Now you tell me the state in this union that is going to have the wherewithal to say, that's all right, we will carry on as normal because we've got lots of money in our back pockets <laughs> and we'll just go out and we'll continue to do this. It will not happen. No. Rawa will help us, the new act, right. you know, no. for recovering America's wildlife. Yeah. But in the main, the contributions that are made by the incentivized communities in conservation are incredible. And one of the most highly uh, incentivized communities are the hunters. And of course, hunting was always identified from the first time that Dr. Valerius Geis summed up the expression of the North American model, it was always identified as integral, and that was based on the history of conservation in North America from about, you know, 1880 up until the present time. Yeah. So there is the connection. I believe. Yeah, that and just the sustainability of the food aspect of it needs yep. regulatory structure 
Of course it does. To maintain it and to allow it to be sustainable. It, it does. And, and all the other things, the, the tenets of that model about, you know, equal access to, the, yes. to this resource, to all yeah. that. It, yeah. It's a very marvelous equation, whether it happened intentionally, happened just, you know, through the evolution of our, of our government systems. But it's a, it's a foundational element to what allows me to go and enjoy wild harvest today and participate in wild harvest. There's no question about that. And, you know, part of, um, I mean, I, I've tried to tell people for 30 years, that, you know, you, this phenomenon is a miracle. It, it, it didn't need to happen at all. We could have just written them off when they were when they were all on their knees in the, the <laughs> 1900 to 1910. When, the, as I said many times, and 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 this is true, had we had an Endangered Species Act at that time, you know, and the systems in place as we do today, all these common species that we hunt today would have been on that list. Yeah, and what that would have meant to the future of all this, who knows? I mean, eventually some good would have happened, but had they been locked away. And had hunting, therefore, been disallowed mm -hmm. for a decade or two decades or three decades or four decades, I mean, think how long it took to recover things like bald eagles and peregrine falcons and so on when we yeah. intervened. And what happens, coming back to this idea of culture, if you didn't have that activity occurring for 10, 20, 30, or 40 years? It'd be gone. And the 40-year-old man or woman who was a hunter now all of a sudden is an 80-year-old person who has... It hasn't hunted in all that period of time. And in that period of time, they have given nothing to teach young people how to participate because there was nothing they could participate in. Yeah. And so, you know, it comes back to the rivet story. You know, how many things do you have to take out of a culture before all of a sudden it just cannot exist on its own? Yeah. There's a certain, there's a certain life force that has to be there, right, yep. to keep it going. And, um, and then, you know, this, this idea of, of wild food is so deeply connected with that. I should raise that there is a bit of a contradiction here that's of historical interest. Because remember, when the North American model and the idea of fair chase hunting and all that was being developed, yeah. there were two sort of antagonisms that oh, yeah. were being <laughs> dealt with. <laughs> and, and, and one was the commercial aspect, yeah. you know, that you killed a lot of wildlife and he made a great deal of money on it, but um, and didn't think about sustainability. You know, you took bison from twelve or twenty million, you brought them down to a couple of hundred yeah. in the space of a decade, a couple of decades, um, or the passenger pigeon from five to seven billion to nothing. Um, but the other, you know, kind of uh, unfriendly, so to speak, was the pot hunter. Right. So here was the, yeah. you know, the, the, the rural poor, uh, to an extent, yeah. of the countries, and in Canada the same, who of course really needed to have access to that wild meat to sustain their family. I mean, they were essentially subsistence hunters, right? They were, mm -hmm. they were hunting for the pot. And so that is a really interesting phenomenon, that the person who sort of most needed the food and who was most... Uh, and 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 was practicing that activity for absolute practical reasons. You know, that was something that the new wave of uh, regulated hunting didn't take too kindly to. But right. that was because it was unregulated. Right. And what they, therefore, what they didn't want to do was to stop somebody harvesting for the pot. They wanted to stop somebody harvesting from the pot that went on under the radar and, yeah. you know, and that eventually became known as poaching, didn't it? Yeah. Right. And that's eventually how we came to understand that. But still, this food business was critically important. And of course, this is also one of the reasons why one of the pillars of the North American model is that there would be democratic access mm -hmm. and that it did not matter your class or how much money you had or you know, whether you were a big landowner or whatever it might be. We all had to apply for our permit and our license the same as each one of us, and, and we would be drawn based on you know, rules right. and regulations yeah. <clears throat> that didn't apply. <clears throat> so I think, there is, I think there is a fundamental connection between the model, and that was part of the thinking 
when the Wild Harvest Initiative was released. But ultimately, I think this idea of wild food is being buoyed by social currents that are not necessarily directly supporting the model in the same way. You know, this whole concern about food security and yeah. where your food comes from. Quality of food. Qu quality of food. Health, just, I mean, people are just much more concerned about health. I mean, you know, everybody's riding a skateboard in the cities and drinking coffees that are made up of, I don't know, magic beans. And, uh, you, know, they, they, you know, they live on lettuce leaves and stuff like this. And so, you know, people are really concerned about their health in ways that, you know, we've never seen before. I mean, one of the phenomenons there, you know, when I, I travel a lot to the United States, I have many friends and colleagues here, and I spend quite a bit of time in the United States and have for a lot of years. The amount of advertising that takes place on your media, like your television and, and so forth, for medical products, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's for bad knees or bad eyeballs or whatever, <laughs> it's, it's just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, you, yeah. it, you know, a news, a news item ends and a newscast ends and, and then there's 15 commercials. Right. And the other really interesting thing, not to get too far off track, but, you know, we always do this. But anyway... You know, the other really interesting thing is you listen to all those side effects on some of those things. Mm -hmm. Holy Moses, who takes them? You know, you know, <laughs> you know side effects may be your head will fall off, you know, or you, you lose a limb. You know? <laughs> but, but, but it's really quite something. But it does reflect this um, focus on health. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that means that we have a broad-based social structure in which we can argue the benefits of wild, healthy foods of all kinds. All right. To people and therefore have them remain supportive of of those activities yeah. and the the benefits the health benefits that come from participating in the yeah. activity yeah. of actually doing it yeah. but well it's like when the europeans came and they i mean they you know the, the, these little relatively short men and women you know came onto this continent and began to look at some of the the native americans you know the the 350 languages that were spoken here, 550 dialects perhaps, the diversity of, of cultures that were maintained, the sophistication of their, of their housing, and then with the agricultural uh, communities, the Native American communities, the, the unbelievable harvest that they were gathering, and then of course the hunting uh, and gathering tribes. Um, but they were, they were astounded by the by the physicality of the people, the, really? the health of the people. Huh. And I mean, even in the last days of the, you know, the, of, the, this, of this abominable tragedy, which also took place in Canada and many other parts of the world where the native cultures were destroyed and victimized in so, so many ways, uh, which is a reality we cannot deny and to some extent a reality we will never escape from. Yeah. Um, you know, even the, uh, the U.S. Cavalry, again, I mean, many of the journals and even from settlers talking about the, the condition of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the Native American or Indian riders, as they mm -hmm. were referred to then. Um, you know, I mean, they even singled out individual peoples like, you know, like Victorio, you know, the, f the famous Apache. I mean, he... he uh, I mean, I mean, so many people remarked, they said, the people who saw him, they said he was the finest specimen of a man that they had ever laid eyes on. Hmm. And, you know, they had some fairly burly guys in the cavalry, I assume, yeah. you know, kind of thing. And, uh, so, you know, and I have a great photograph of him in my, in my home. Mm -hmm. But um, so this idea of how health comes from natural foods, mm -hmm. we, we had evidence of that in a continental transition when Europeans came to this continent first and met the Native Americans who were living here. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we know, of course, from our medical science subsequently, you know, the health of this wild food in terms of, you know, the, 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 amount, the, the amount of vitamins and minerals and the low cholesterol, the low fats and so on and so forth, relatively speaking, that are in these, these wild foods. Mm -hmm.